uh, welcome to our School of Information Colloquium series. We're really happy to see folks from different departments and from the community. Um, and we are presenting today Dr. Anna Cooper from the School of Film, Theater, and Television is talking about the film canon. Her talk is called, as you can see, A, a New Feminist Critique of Film Canon, Moving Beyond Neoliberalism in the Digital Era. So welcome. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I was just saying, I'm always so, um, uh, I mean, I'm really excited to see, to hear your feedback from kind of a different disciplinary perspective to, to what I'm usually in, so I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm just going to dive in. Um, so this is a kind of a, this basically, um, the, uh, this talk kind of came out of, I started, to, usually I'm much more of a textual textual person, I usually do a lot more thinking about the film text, but I started to think, to think a lot more about the shape of film culture and the ways that we remember and preserve films. Um, about five years ago, actually coinciding with um, when uh, there was a Sight and Sound poll, which is a uh, film canon list that I'll talk about. Um, it came, the most recent version of it came out in 2012, and I looked at it and I was like, wow, we're not making much progress here, are we? Um, so I got kind of interested in thinking more about that, and this is basically the result. Um, so list making has long been a significant aspect of film culture. Perhaps the earliest film canon list was published in, in 1930, and in 1952, Sight and Sound put out the results of its first greatest films of all time poll, which has since become a well-known decennial tradition. As Jonathan Lupo establishes, there was a major proliferation of such lists beginning in the 1980s, corresponding with the period of intellectual ferment now uh, around uh, the concept and role of canon, now broadly known as the culture wars. Given the rise of Reaganism, with its reactionary reassertions of patriarchal and white supremacist authority, as a backlash against a perceived onslaught of advances in the rights of women, people of color, LGBT people, and so on, uh, the culture wars were in hindsight a symptom of the broader crisis um, of liberalism and its evolution towards neoliberalism. The rise of film canon lists in this period was a contested practice, which could be put, in, put to work for either side. This might function either as enunciations of a supposedly universal, patriarchal, or white authority, or on the contrary, as progressive acts of visibility for texts forgotten by the traditional canon. During this period, the very existence of film studies proclaimed the value of popular cultural texts and was itself seen by some conservative critics as an assault on the canon. Nevertheless, the discipline had its own internal version of the culture wars. As Janet Steiger reports in her definitive 1985 article on the topic, there's basically, oh, by the way, really little has been written since then on this area. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 1985 was the last kind of like important piece of writing on this on this area um, by Janet Steiger. Um, so she has had reports in her uh, 1985 article. Um, uh, early film theorists argued for a, quote, a politics of admission, in which some films um, should be included under the category of art. This eventually evolved into the establishment of film studies as a discipline, initially focused on aesthetic evaluation and a romantic auteurism, in which, as Steiger critiques it, quote, knowledge, righteousness, wisdom, and truth are in the hands of a select group, which implicitly pro 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 uh, provides standards for every culture and individual. Ideological critics, most prominently the founders of feminist film theory, including Claire Johnston, Laura Mulvey, Annette Kuhn, and Ian Kaplan, uh, all differed, critiquing the notion of a universal canon for its misogynist characteristics and or its masochistic positioning for a feminine spectator. Steiger, though sympathetic with these feminist critiques of canon, ultimately sees canon formation as unavoidable. She argues that, um, quote, selection by evaluation can be made less dangerous for marginalized groups if such selection is made with an awareness of the politics of the chosen criteria and with the politics of eliminating power of some groups over others, of centering at the expense of marginalizing classes, genders, sexual orientations, or cultures. Steiger's position represents what became a kind of liberal status quo, not only in film studies, but across many areas of Western culture for much of the past 30 or more years. To push for inclusion of an ever-widening swathe of marginalized groups into, within the upper echelons of traditionally hierarchical power structures, typically designated as diversity or inclusion, um, this approach often relies on the good intentions of socially privileged people in positions of authority. The great neoliberal paradox is that despite some progress in these uh, liberal goals in this period, inequality along various lines has been on the rise during these same years. Thus increasingly, liberal positions like Steiger's have been recast as at best moderately progressive, fundamentally leaving power structures in place which include a few relatively politically compliant or assimilationist examples of diverse works or people. 
So here's some major critiques of diver this diversity discourse that have kind of arisen in the last few years. Um, Sarah Ahmed argues that diversity discourse is often essentially a branding exercise that produces a, quote, positive, shiny image of an organization, which ultimately, quote, allows inequalities to be concealed and thus reproduced. She shows how a commitment to diversity, often posed as a gesture of invitation or welcome by an institution, presupposes the whiteness of the institution doing the welcoming and thus paradoxically reaffirms that whiteness. Other critics point out that a commitment to diversity does not necessarily imply a dedication to social or redistributive justice. Gloria Ansaldua posits that diversity discourse has been widely adopted by universities and other institutions precisely because it can be made to seem power neutral, a superficial overlay that does not disrupt any comfort zones. Indeed, as Himani Banerjee powerfully argues, diversity is deployed as a coping mechanism for dealing with an actually conflicting heterogeneity that can even be utilized to justify neo-colonialist and neo-fascist projects. Although much of this work intervenes primarily in racism in institutions of higher education, I believe such a framework for, for critique can also apply to hegemonies of gender and to the institution of film canon. The politics of inclusion of women is ultimately quite limited in what it can accomplish in the realm of creating more progressive or diverse film canon because of how it paradoxically recenters masculinity. This paper explores whether more radical solutions than liberalism are needed in terms of how we organize, memorialize, and preserve films in order to achieve equality and social justice for women in film culture. So um, any contemporary assessment of film canon, of course, has to take account of the internet. When it first arose as a mass medium in the 1990s, it was born into and ultimately intervened in a world of fraught arguments about the value of films and film canon. As Kate Egan has shown, underground list-making cultures first arising in the 1980s, as VHS altered the landscape of film fandom, consolidated into online cultures in the 1990s. From the 1990s to the present, the transition from analog to digital publication, and slightly later the transition from one way to social media-based flows of information, has enabled a vast acceleration in the creation of film canon lists, both by fans and commercial publications. Such lists are now incredibly common, as numerous organizations, pub publications, and blogs disseminate lists of best films. Such lists might either be general, like best films ever made, or specific to a certain genre or time period or identity. Indeed, there are now even meta-lists which aggregate the results of thousands of other lists. So the five phenomenon and they shoot pictures, don't they, are two examples of these meta-lists. So the present account traces how film canon has changed as its modes of publication and publicity have evolved from analog to digital. It examines three of the most important and visible film canon lists in Anglophone film culture, each a kind of a stop along the way in this evolution. The American Film Institute's list, um, the Sight and Sound 20 poll from 2012, um, and the Internet Movie Database's um, film rating system with its resulting top 250 films list. So each one represents a different stage in this process, respectively moving from analog films, especially television, when we're talking about the AFI list, um, to, uh, to, um, to the kind of uneven relocations of print media within a growing internet to a contemporary social media-based model. Including some exploratory, exploratory quantitative data in each case, this paper explores the gendered implications of these evolving modes of dissemination and increasingly collection of film canon-related data in terms of gendered hegemonies. Clearly in the vast reaches of the digital, there's room for both the reinforcement of and challenges to gendered hegemonic power. This contradiction is reflected in feminist scholarship about the internet. Beginning with Donna Haraway's 1984 track, A Cyborg Manifesto, feminist studies of information technologies have often taken something of a celebratory tone, exploring how women can, create, can creatively harness technology to fight oppression or liberate themselves from traditional notions of gender, the body, and identity politics. Um, Aristea Fotopoulou's recent book, Feminist Activism and Digital Networks, offers an excellent overview of this kind of work. However, particularly in recent years, some feminist studies of information technology have taken a far more critical view. Perhaps most memorably, Virginia Eubanks' accomplished book, Digital Dead End, um, explores how differences in technological access are deeply gendered and how information technologies are embedded within pre-existing systems of oppression. As most, both hardware and software, is created by economically privileged white men, Eubanks argues, such systems are often experienced by the poor, women, and people of color as vexatious, intrusive, and hostile, reducing their complex needs to inflexible schema. This runs counter to dominant narratives of technology as liberating, empowering, or inclusive. 
My analysis of the transition to digital publication model explores which framework better suits film canon. Has the internet acted as a liberatory force on film culture, or has it simply facilitated or even accelerated pre-existing gender oppressive conditions? So in the sections that follow, I'll examine each of these three major film canon lists, um, and I'll just kind of give some, some basic quantitative data to help assess kind of gender disparities in both the processes and results. Hang on a second, I'm gonna grab my water. Um, all right, so the AFI list from 1997. Um, so with the process, unfortunately, very little information has been released. Um, here's what we do know. It's, uh, this is kind of a quote from, from them. It's chosen by more than 1,500 leaders from across the American film community, screenwriters, directors, actors, producers, etc., to choose from a list of 400 nominated films compiled by AFI and select the 100 greatest American movies. There's no information about how they came up with those 400 nominated films, who, who came up with it or how. Um, and it's just this kind of, and they don't say who voted, they don't say how they voted, they don't see any demographic info about who voted, nothing. We have like zero information. Um, so, um, so it was kind of regrettably makes it impossible to assess the process in very much detail. But the result um, gives us a pretty dismal baseline. Um, so there's kind of three kind of ways to assess you know, it's kind of gender equity and, and, and stuff in a list like this. So whether films are directed by women is one of them. Whether uh, they have, uh, or they're about women, or whether they are in a, like a women-oriented genre are the kind of three ways I think about it. Um, so in terms of film by women, zero on the list um, is directed by women. The initial list of 400 um, actually had uh, two, five of, uh, directed or co-directed by women, but none of them made it to the final list. Um, so that's a, a rate of 1.25%. Um, the AFI list thus manages to have significantly worse numbers than either the contemporaneous or current film industry in terms of the inclusion of women directors. In 1998, um, the top 250 grossing films in Hollywood had 9% women directors. In 2017, it was 11%. So of course, this is a historical, so across the history of US cinema, um, the numbers of women-directed films are presumably lower than in the contemporary era, although just how low is not known. Um, so, um, you know, so that's, you know, we're kind of comparing apples to oranges here a little bit, but still, it seems pretty dismal. Um, and, you know, the AFI list could be said to simply reflect these kind of problems with, um, you know, problems that are already there um, with, you know, historiography and cultural memory that function to kind of make a bad situation worse. Um, but it's still worth noting that the AFI list makes no gesture, gestures towards even a basic kind of liberal intervention, towards inclusivity um, uh, in its results. Its opacity about its methodology, I think, also shows a lack of kind of these basic gestures of accountability around inclusion. Um, so in terms of films about women, it's actually kind of not too bad. Um, about 29 of the 100 films have either gender balanced leading roles or um, feature a female protagonist. That's actually, so it's not too bad. Um, Again, Martha Lauz, going on Martha Lauzen's most recent study, um, we see uh, you know women comprise about 24% of all protagonists and 34% of all speaking characters in the top 100 Hollywood films in 2017. So again, we're kind of looking at contemporary numbers, but still, 29% seems not too bad. Um, so. Um, of course, though, it should be kept in mind that these numbers say nothing about the sexist stereotyping or other misogynist treatment these characters may be subject to. Um, so, in terms of films for women, kind of films made in genres for women, um, of course, genres are a mal malleable category, and any given film's assignment to a particular genre is rarely absolute. Um, but still, in both the industry and scholarship, you know, some genres have long been conceptualized as oriented towards a particular gender. Um, so 44 out of the total of 100 films on the AFI list fall into a genre typically identified as masculine, um, still noir, war, film, western. Um, 21 titles fall into women-oriented genres like romantic comedy, women's film, or musical, and 26 fall into neutral genres like horror, comedy, and animation. Um, and the remaining nine are non-genre art films. I'm going to talk more later about like the gender dynamics of that. Um, so. 
Uh, another potentially more submerged issue here is at stake as well, and that is the dynamics of genius, which has been extensively shown by scholars like Christine Badersby and Linda Nochlin to be a gendered concept that applies primarily to men. The concept of genius is interwoven into the AFI list. Of course, many of the films on the list are by male auteurs, but perhaps even more importantly, many films which top the list are about male genius figures. Take Citizen Kane. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which uh, sits atop both the AFI and Sight and Sound lists. It's a film about a male genius by an auteur director who persistently promoted, him, promoted himself as a genius um, and stars himself in the title role. So it's like this Mobius strip of layered <laughs> identifications with the male genius figure. And it's the one that, you know, is that kind of stereotype typically at the top of all these lists all the time, the best film ever made. Um, so, um, you know, other examples abound. Just to take a few from near the top of the AFI list, we have The Godfather, Lawrence of Arabia, Schindler's List, Vertigo, 2001. These are all by male auteur directors and are arguably about loner male genius heroes imposing their will on the world. So the AFI list uh, gives the distinct impression that it's invested in recuperating the myth of the male genius. Um, so these gendered dynamics have really real-world consequences in the film industry and film culture in ways that it turns out are deeply affected by its methods of dissemination, which in this case jive very well with patriarchal capitalism. The primary function of the AFI list was to serve as the basis for a promotion of back catalog films on television, VHS, and DVD. It was used in the creation of a much-touted three-hour CBS special hosted by Jodie Foster, Richard Gere, and Sally Field. The AFI collected $30 million in sponsorship money from CBS. Various VHS and DVD distribution and rental companies struck branding deals with the AFI. The cable channels TNT and TCM each made follow-up television programs about the films on the list. The whole affair was lauded by the trade press as the first time, quote, the first time the competing home video companies normally fighting each other for shelf space have ever worked together to create a wide-ranging promotional campaign. The film selected for the AFI list thus got a significant boost in terms of access, a boost which has likely continued in subsequent decades as most of the films on the list continue to be easily and cheaply available despite multiple changes in format. The AFI list then um, affects not only which films are promoted for sales, but which films are available for viewing at all. Comparing this with, for example, Mediascape's list of American films by women directors, uh, many of which are extremely hard to find. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know. We, it seems clear that um, patriarchal knowledge slash power appears to extend outwards through capitalist change of distribution and marketing, effectively making film culture more unequal in the process. The AFI model for creating and disseminating a film canon list functions, one might say, as a tool for silencing as much as for promotion. Okay, moving on to the Sight and Sound 2012 Greatest Films of All Time poll. Um, this list both exemplifies the liberal strategy of inclusivity and demonstrates its shortcomings. This poll is the most recent iteration of the highbrow British film magazine's film canon exercise conducted every 10 years since 1952. In 2012, they asked several hundred film journalists, academics, festival executives, and filmmakers, sourced by, quote, chains of recommendation, I'm going to talk more about that, um, to send a list of 10 films that they considered to be the greatest films of all time. The films that were mentioned most often by contributors were collected into two separate top 100 lists, one for critics and one for directors. Um, although essentially following a traditional publication model, Sight and Sound did use their website in an innovative way in 2012. They made complete results available, including the names of all contributors and the 10 films each one submitted. This transparency means it is possible to look in detail at their demographics. The magazine obtained a total of 846 responses for the critics' poll and 358 for the directors' poll. Out of this total of 1,204 responses, a total of 21% were from women, 14% in the directors' poll, 24% in the critics' poll. Um, this total represents a 17% increase from the previous poll in 2002. Um, while these proportions for, and they also, by the way, were actually trying really hard to include more women in the process. This was like the result of, you know, really um, a lot of effort on that, on that front. Um, so, so the proportions of women respondents may at first seem appallingly low, but it actually turns out Sight and Sound has done a comparatively good job of including women, performing at or above the baseline numbers of women in film production and film journalism. Um, so um, there are 14% of women directors um, in the director's poll mirrors the 14% of new British films that have women directors, um, and it actually improves on the 11% of um, American women-directed films. 
Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, 24% of respondents in this poll who were women in the critics poll, that is, um, it's actually a modest improvement on the 22% um, of generally of um, professional um, critics who are women. So it's a mod again a modest improvement, roughly kind of matches. Um, so they're kind of it, it, you know we might we must lament that so few critics and directors and other film industry professionals are women, but Sight and Sound actually kind of upholds the status quo in this regard more or less. Um, so it also states. Um, that this is a result of a concerted effort to include more women and more racial, ethnic, and cultural minorities. Following Ahmed, we might observe how such efforts can paradoxically function to recenter hegemonic identity, since men are implicitly the ones doing the inviting here. Um, does this inclusivity in the process lead to more diverse results? Again, I'll parse this into films by, about, and for women. Um, so for films by women, um, on the top 100 in the critics' poll, two are directed by women. Um, Chantal Ackerman's Jean Dielman and uh, Claire Denise uh, Beau Travail. Um, one's at number 35 and one's at number 78. Um, the director's poll has only one woman directed film, again, Beau Travail at number 91. So, you know, two films out of 100. Really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, of course, an improvement over the AFI list, which was zero, <laughs> um, but it's kind of only a minor one. Um, and also, I think something is particularly telling here, which is that the choice of female-directed films um, are both francophone. Um, of course, French has long been associated with avant-garde and art cinema in the English-speaking world. Um, and, of course, and they're also both made by directors who are central to second-wave feminist cinema. Rosalind Galt has argued that second-wave second feminism often distrusted and devalued femininity, so much so that it ended up inadvertently reifying many of the masculinist traits of highbrow aesthetics. Second wave feminist cinema then, despite its radical politics, ends up fitting in quite well with an elitist, academically oriented framework of film canon. Films about women, um, when we're thinking about those. Um, the Sight and Sound list has a slightly greater equi equity on this dimension. I estimate about 38% of films um, with a balance, uh, have a balance of gender representation and or a female protagonist. Um, so, again, this does not account for misogynist stereotyping, but nevertheless, it does seem like the sight and sound poll appears to do even better than the AFI list by this measure. Well, both aren't too bad. Um, in terms of films for women, so this is, it's, I count only six, actually, on the critics' poll that are in women's genres, but that's really not very informative, um, just because most of the films on the list are non-genre art films. So, um, it's, again, so it's not really very informative. Um, so, but in fact, I would argue that art cinema in general, and the sight and sound poll in particular, has an elite aesthetics of collection that paradoxically recenters patriarchal power and the male viewer, even as it includes some art for, by, and about women. Achman discusses how diversity has been imagined as an, quote, arrangement of colorful sweets, implicitly there to be enjoyed by a white male consumer for whom diversity is positioned as a benefit. Although art cinema has frequently been critiqued for its foundational Eurocentrism, organized it as it is so often in a classically colonialist center to periphery mapping with Europe at the center, um, there has been less discussion of how such a dynamic might apply to gender. Ultimately, its approach to marginal works is similar to the functioning of diversity discourse within academic institutions that Ahmed critiques. It's somewhat inclusive, but in a way that ultimately not only fails to challenge, but actually recenters white male anglophone critics as arbiters of taste. The sight and sound poll's method for sourcing contributors via chains of recommendation from other contributors virtually guarantees that it will participate in institutional processes of self-reproduction. There's another aspect of the data that supports this reading. Um, I projected a hypothetical case in which a full 50% of contributors were women, assuming that the additional women uh, voted exactly the same way as the existing ones. Um, so table one shows the results of this. So on the, um, did you have a pointer at this point? No. Okay, so over here is, um, this is the original um, top, we're just looking at the top 20 films on the site and sound critics poll. Oh, sorry, combined critics and directors poll. Over here is what happens if we kind of reweight it so that 50%, oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> and it doesn't work on the screen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a laser for <laughs> try Thank you. <laughs> um, Okay, so here's if we um, just kind of reweight the the rankings so that 50, if, uh, you know 50% of the voters 
if, as if they were 50% women, assuming that the, or the new women vote the same way as the existing women. Um, and you, I'm just, so there's two um, titles down here that disappear and two others that appear. But I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say this is not a radical difference. There's, um, there's, there's also some different changes in rankings. You know, La Règle du Jeu goes to number, from number five to number six. You know, the searchers goes from number eight down to number 11. You know, but I'm just going to say this, out yeah, of the top 20, this is really, there's not much here that's very different. Um, so, um, so, what this suggests is that women voters are largely stepping into an already well-defined field of greatest films, choosing their own personal list from amongst a relatively narrow bracket of titles. It would appear that even the very concept of greatest films carries with it an elitist masculinist cachet that causes even many otherwise bold independent thinkers to defer to higher authorities on these matters, voting to reinforce an already existing canon that has been cemented through the decades by a patriarchal film culture. Women's art has at best a very limited role to play in this pre-existing order, and the women's art which is included, as I argued, tends to fit well within elitist discourses. Yet another indication of the dynamics of elite institutionalism at work in the site and sample is the age distribution of contributors. Um, so the five phenomenon, which is a website focusing on statistical analysis of various film lists, actually compiled an extensive analysis of the sight and sound list, including that what they did was they used Wikipedia to look up the birth dates of all the contributors on the list. Yeah, and they gave me their data, so just a big thank you to them. I did not, I did not compile this data. Um, so, um, uh, so what they found, so they found uh, that 392 out of the total of 1,204 contributors had Wikipedia pages that listed their birth dates. So not all of them, it's already a minority. And um, I just want to, so it's kind of also clearly a non-random sample. So just put, putting that out there, that this is not necessarily completely, um, um, you know, it's, it's non-random, it's not, it's not necessarily completely reliable. But nevertheless, um, that, uh, we, they found that 49% um, of voters were born before 1960. So about half, and so this was in 2012, so that means about half um, of the, those voting on the poll were over age 52 at the time. So that's a really old skewing population of voters on this list. Um, but they also found that there were actually no really big differences in how they voted. So young people and old people voting on this list, are, it's not, there's no big differences. Um, so clearly these younger voters are largely entering into a greatest films universe then, in which canonical films have already been chosen. It would be too simplistic to say that earlier generations of critics who may have contributed to the formation of, of such tastes were all male, particularly in the UK. There was a mid-century flourishing of kind of middle-brow women critics in the UK that were actually um, kind of slowly edged out as cinema came, became increasingly um, to be seen as a high art worthy of men's critical attention in the 1960s. Nevertheless, the history of film criticism is largely a men's realm, um, particularly when it comes to list making. And this seems pertinent to understanding how a previous de previously defined canon handed down to a new generation of critics might be patriarchally informed. Overall, then, in the sight and sound poll, we see the failures of liberalism play themselves out. Even a major commitment to inclusion in methods does not lead to much diversity in the elite institution of film canon. There are connections, moreover, between the liberal institutional diversity discourse at work in the Sight and Sound Poll and its hybrid publication format, wherein the main results were published in the magazine while the data was fleshed out on the website. The magazine's published results, much like the AFI list, embody the outward flow of information of traditional publication, replicating those entrenched problems endemic to such hierarchies. The second online part echoes the neoliberal tendency toward bureaucratic transparency, using statistics and hard figures, as Ahmed puts it, as a mode for displaying apparent progress in terms of institutional diversity that nevertheless ultimately fails to destabilize power in any meaningful way. Um, okay, now we have IMDb. Um, So given how the internet has been vaunted as a space of liberation, we might hope that IMDb's rating system, with its social media-based model method in which any user of the site can contribute, um, would upend the power dynamics at work in the other two lists by demolishing the institutional reproduction at work on those lists. Unfortunately, this is not the case. By virtually all measures, the IMDb list is actually worse than the other two lists. Um, IMDb's method for compiling its top 250 list is as follows. 
Users um, can rate any film for one to ten stars. Uh, ratings are then weighted according to an undisclosed kind of proprietary formula, um, and they don't tell us exactly what this algorithm is. It's you know they keep it as a trade secret. Um, but then, um, but films that have at least twenty five thousand ratings are eligible to be put on the top two fifty list if they also have very high rankings. It's kind of but there's some. It's unclear exactly how they figure this out, um, and they won't tell you. Um, so. Um, yeah, uh, so kind of not great. But um, the results, um, not a single film on the top 250 list was directed by a woman. Um, I count 44 films with gender balanced casts or a female protagonist, which is about 18%, as well as 20 films in women's genres, which is about, about 8%. And all those numbers are poor compared to the other two lists. Um, the only, um, so, and by the way, and with the, the women's genres, um, you know, with sight and sound, it was six percent, but um, you know, but that was most of the films are genre films. That's not true on IMDb. On IMDb, they're almost all genre films. They're just men's genres, so it doesn't kind of have that excuse. Um, so here's a little chart. It's a little bit hard to see, so I apologize. But it, just to give you a little bit of um, a sense of um, uh, comparison. Um, so the only measure by which IMDb doesn't do as badly as or significantly worse than the other two lists is on, oh, the percentage of women's genres, I kind of already just said that. Um, so uh, a look at the numbers of women participants on IMDb raises as many questions as it answers. Women generated only 17% of all user ratings for films on the top 250 list. Since participation in IMDb ratings is open to all and has no restrictions, um, that means that none of the methods for institutional reproduction um, that are at work on the other lists um, are, is, is happening here. So that means that women are self-selecting out of participation in quite significant numbers. It's actually lower than for the sight and sound poll, which you know, made this effort to include women. Um, due to financial limitations of this study, I was not able to find out how many ratings are cast by women across all films on the entire site not just the top two videos. Basically what I was doing was like pulling data by hand from the site. If I had like somewhat, you know, web developer who could scrape data, then that would be different. But basically, so I don't know what it is across the whole site, but for the top 250 films, it was 17%. Um, so that might have proved informative to find out if it's better or worse for other films. Um, so when, as before, I kind of projected this hypothetical case where women account for 50% of voters, while, um, or of votes rather, while voting exactly the same way as current women voters. Um, it's kind of a similar bleak result. Not quite as bad, but um, I mean, there's some films that disappear from, from the top. I'm just looking at the top 20 here. There's some other films that turn up, um, but uh, you know, about half of the films that turn up are still very kind of male oriented. So The Dark Knight Rises, American History X, um, Leon, you know, these are all. <laughs> Yeah, pretty male-oriented genres. But then, of course, there are some others that are much more, you know, arguably like female-oriented, um, like Anshu Shabla and Life is Beautiful and The Lion King and so on. Um, so, um, yeah. So it is. It's you know, by this measure, it's maybe maybe not as bad as Sight and Sound, but not quite as kind of um, um, predetermined as Sight and Sound. But still, it doesn't seem like it's going to revolutionize canon on its own. Um, so how do we explain women's exclusion from a completely self-selecting group of raters? I have two angles for answering this question. The first is that helpfully the issue has already received attention in relation to Wikipedia, um, whose contributors are also a self-selecting group, and they were discovered to be less than 15% female in 2010. The result for this staggering difference in numbers of men versus women in Wikipedia has been explored by Benjamin Collier and Julia Baer, who find a number of factors that contribute to, to the dearth of women. They find that the high levels of conflict in, involved in the editing process, as well as the high levels of confidence required to engage in, in such spirited debate, to see one's own contributions as valuable, and to edit and delete others' work instead of using more collaborative models, all contribute to women's decisions both to never become editors to begin with and to quit contributing when they had previously done so. Women's training in patriarchy to behave agreeably and to feel less confident has exerted a powerful force on their, their participation in the public arenas of the internet. We can reasonably speculate that similar forces are at work in women's lack of participation in IMDb voting. Put plainly, we see here the quantifiable effects of patriarchy on women's voices and the convergence of film culture and internet culture. Roughly 64% of women who in an equal world would participate in online canon processes are here absent and voiceless. 
Another approach to understanding women's exclusion from IMDb is historical. The site arose in the late 1980s when Cole Needham, then a recent computer science graduate, turned to Usenet groups to seek out other film fans who came to share the lists of titles, actresses, and so on with each other. Needham began compiling these lists into a database which he eventually put online in 1990. In 1993, he turned it into an early internet startup, eventually incorporating it in 1996. Usenet, accessible only to professional computer scientists and serious hobbyists, was an overwhelmingly male space. Indeed, one of the earliest lists to be incorporated into, into Needham's database was a list of attractive actresses. Given this origin story, it is a uh, little surprise that Karen Boyle, as Karen, uh, excuse me, given this origin story, it's a little surprise that as Karen Boyle has shown in her article on its film reviewing culture, quote, IMDb constructs a discursive terrain which is distinctly male, in which its mostly male us users deploy heavily gendered strategies for engaging with film texts. As recent analysis um, by Walt Hickey has shown, um, male IMDb users are actually sabotaging the ratings of films and television shows they perceive to be aimed at women by giving them only one star, likely without even having watched them. A form of semi-organized gender warfare playing out in the discursive space of IMDb ratings and reviews. At IMDb then, a site with a considerable history of male control and sexist culture, one that is longer but likely not fundamentally different from that at many large internet companies, um, online, on, online misogyny intersects with and buttresses the entrenched sexism of anglophone film culture. So, what are my conclusions? Um, we're forced to conclude that the liberal strategy of diversity or inclusion, um, an institutional status quo, excuse me, we're forced to conclude that the liberal strategy of diversity and inclusion, an institutional status quo for the past 30 plus years, has not significantly improved the institution of film canon. In the sight and sound list, a commitment to diversity in the process did not lead to significant changes in the results, which was revealed in entrenched institutional reproduction. In the case of IMDb, we, came to, we come to the Eubanksian conclusion that the internet has only replicated entrenched misogyny and has actually even escalated its sway over film canon. Given these failures, the only real hope may be that a more radical solution exists which might effectively harness film canon as a tool for increasing social justice. Distant reading methods, which look across an entire body of texts for large-scale patterns, rather than the more typical method of reading a small number of texts closely, could be a place to start. Such a method would at the least yield further information about all that has been erased in the processes of canonization, and possibly provide useful data that would help us to reconceptualize film canon. Franco Moretti pioneered distant reading, discovering that the works, the works of literature constituting the scholarly canon actually com comprise only a tiny portion of the totality of world literature, organizing, organized in a colonialist center to periphery arrangement. Uh, Eric Hoyt has experimented with bringing digitally executed distant reading methods to film studies. His work on the Lantern database of historic film periodicals has demonstrated that there exists a scholarly canon of a handful of widely cited film trade papers and fan magazines, while around half of all historic film periodicals have never been cited at all. Hoyt suggests that using methods such as topic modeling to assess the kinds of information that might be available in these neglected periodicals, to compare them to more cited periodicals, and to track how film periodicals have changed over time. A similar method could be applied to cinematic texts to find out more about the broad shapes of the history of film outside of the familiar canonized titles. Indeed, since IMDb already exists as an extensive and highly detailed database of films, a skilled web developer could potentially scrape IMDb's data relatively easily and find out exactly how many and what sorts of films are currently invisible. Since IMDb has details of VHS and DVD release, as well as some information about streaming availability, it would be, uh, also be possible to look into patterns of, of distribution over time for historical titles and compare how canonical versus non-canonical films go into and out of availability. One could then track this information according to the gender of the filmmaker, for example, to understand better how patriarchy is embedded within capitalist systems of distribution of film texts. Armed with such data, one might then begin thinking about how to reorganize film canon to push against its current norms. Building churn into the system might have benefits, whether this were accomplished by simply eliminating the films that have too much can canonical authority already, or by incorporating, quote, term limits, you know, for a given title, or by reweighting the selected selection criteria in order to boost films that are by, about, or for with people with various marginalized identities. Such approaches would at the very least help to upend the current ossified hierarchies. Even more radically, one might try to reimagine film canon in a way that would emphasize interconnectedness and an appreciation for the broad range of film history rather than ranking, quote, more circles of ideas than towers of titles, as Rick Pillinger uh, eloquently put it in our correspondence on the topic. 
The, the advantage of the failure of liberalism in film canon, if there is one, is that the field is wide open for new visions and structures to emerge. Aided by digital tools that are yet to be built, the time is right to begin to reimagine film canon as an institution and as a mode of knowing. Thanks. Go ahead. I, I just was going to say, if you'd like to have a question and answer session, we can do that as well. I know I have some questions as well. I'd love that, yeah. Thanks. Um, would anybody like to start with any any questions? Um, well, I really appreciate your talk. I'm sorry I um, came in a little late, a little no, late so you may have addressed this. Um, I wonder um, if the sight and sound poll had um, used um, sort of broader methodology, sort of instead of just saying, give me your top 10, mm -hmm. but rather letting people select from a larger list. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that could have yielded um, better results. Like I'm wondering actually if, if someone were designing this poll now and trying to update this, mm -hmm. I wonder if using the sight and sound reviewer methodology, but then um, giving people more than just give me your top 10 mm -hmm. might actually be able to mm -hmm. um, to be the best of both worlds. So, so what are you suggesting? So that it would be if more than top, more than ten, it'd be say twenty or, or fifty or what do you what do you mean? Um, possibly. That's a great question. Um, but uh, I guess the AFI approach would mm -hmm. allow people to vote for a hundred. No, uh, actually, well, I don't know how many votes people gave. Actually, that's a good question. Um, but they were given a list of four hundred films, and but how those films were themselves chosen is not told. Set. Sorry? I so said that's the problem, the yeah. list. Yeah, exactly. So how, so if you're starting with an initial list, how do you choose what those yeah. films are? Like that's the big question I think. Um, are, and if and, and the and the problem is that any any kind of thing you do could could still be exclusive. So for example, if you went by, you know, the, the highest grossing films or something, I mean that's already gonna exclude a lot, almost all films by women, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you know, so any particular way that you choose those titles, that, that's really the crux <coughs> of the issue, I think. Um, Does that answer your question? Or you yeah, I, I, I mean, I have this little idea in the back of my mind. It's like, I bet that you could put this together into a really cool new poll. But <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> That's a cool idea. I just wanted to make a comment that last year, um, I was very excited. There was a performance artist named Tracy Morris that came to town. Mm -hmm. um, through, a, we have a nice local press called Corey Press. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they, you know, I thought she was going to be doing a, a feminist or really alternative reading of what she was doing, which was a performance alongside presentation of the film Eyes Wide Shut. Mm -hmm. And it was so disappointing because once the film started playing, it turned out that mostly what she was doing was pointing out over and over again, Kubrick's genius, you know, and, and meanwhile there's this, um, you know, the film is this tapestry of, of naked women's bodies, all white, thin women's bodies looking exactly the same. It's almost like they become wallpaper or something. There's so much of it in the film. Are, um, are you familiar with the film? Or, um, and I, I just, I couldn't help but ask myself, you know, how is it that this, you know, she's this, I, I guess, even people who are presenting themselves as offering really different perspectives, you know, and, and artistic and sometimes radical perspectives, you know, and the idea that arts, you know, and, and film are so related and experimentality in those arenas, uh, you know, I, I really have wondered at what point does it become necessary for them to believe what everybody else believes in order to get where they are, in order to become, you know, a traveling performance artist that gets paid to do, you know, this $70 plate dinner to present this thing that ultimately tells us what everybody's already saying, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And have you found any of that type of work where people are kind of engaging with this stuff um, in more of a, you know, in an artistic way um, that you think is really good that you could recommend watching? Oh. Um, yes. <laughs> um, uh, so a really great place, is, I mentioned it, but I'll, I'll say the, the name again. In fact, oh, we don't have, we do have a whiteboard, maybe I'll write it up. Um, Mediascape, which is a, um, like a film studies journal, mm -hmm. published a list of films, like 100 films by women directors. I think they're all American, if I remember correctly. And it's a really wonderful list, but they're super hard to find, a lot of them. But it's still a really great place to start. So, um, Mediascape. Um, and if, yeah, if you just Google like 100 
films by women directors or something like that. You should be able to find it. Um, yeah, that's a really great place to start for some of the more the more out there stuff. Again, it's all American though, which you know obviously is a limitation in itself. So um, yeah, um, just thinking, where else could I send you? Uh, hmm. Um, I mean, there's just such wonderful work by you know global women directors too. That's that's coming out all the time. Um, a, a place to look for that would be Pat Patricia White has a book called let's, um, what's it called? It's about like global women directors, contemporary global women directors. I can't remember exactly what it's called. And a lot of the stuff she's writing about would also be a great place. Um, I can't guarantee you that everything on all these lists would be like really radical politically all the time, but <laughs> it's certainly like a place to start if you're looking for more out of the way women directors. Now, there's also Census of Cinema, mm -hmm. which is an online journal, and they have an annual that they call the World Poll, in which anyone can write in and say, these are the films I've seen this year that I really like. Mm -hmm. And they organize it uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. um, so you can just click on people or click on a film, and it's really good. It's a good source for um, you know, a more global look at what's happening in film mm -hmm. than just you know, US-based kind of hegemony. Um, another film that if, uh, um, actually I think really does address a lot of these issues in a very self-aware way that would be you might enjoy with is um, Watermelon Woman, directed by Cheryl Dunye. Mm -hmm. Do you know it? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. So I would really be interested in knowing who are who are the people who are assembling these lists mm -hmm. because I think that's really important. That's a good point. To, to yeah, who's know, doing it? Yeah and, yeah, and you know what yeah. interests do they have? And, you know, in producing these lists, mm -hmm. because you know you already said they're very you know, they're kind of Hollywood, U.S. based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So who within these organizations? In yeah, words? who within the organizations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's a really good point, and often it's not said. I mean IMDb won't give any names of any individual people. AFI, I don't think I have. Um, I uh, uh, sight and sound, I think, do good, does give a little yeah. more info about that, but yeah. Because I mean, oftentimes in the U.S. context, I mean, if you ask you know people publicly, they don't even really know who directed films. It's not yeah, you know, true. You know. Yeah. Um, the other thing, though, that I'll say is um, that it, you know it, the way that institutional reproduction works it is such that even if women are doing the compiling and are in charge of all of this, it's still it's not necessarily you know like yeah. <laughs> you know I mean that's actually something that's been found with the criterion collection for example the criterion collection actually most of the people you know who work for them who are making decisions about what gets put out you know on DVD through them is they you know are mostly women actually and yet they have a really similar I was, I was just at SCMS and there was this great paper about this about how criterion collections has a lot of the really the same issues even mm -hmm. though it's most it's like the majority of women are mm -hmm. are deciding mm -hmm. but actually because you, you pointed out a uh, a few times in your talk, actually, the fact that a lot of women directed films are not even easily accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with is if people can't access the film to see it, they can't vote on it being a good film mm -hmm. or being a, being a part of the canon. Yeah, yeah exactly. And But it's it, but it's circular because yeah, that's like, the problem. <laughs> yeah, stuff's not on the canon, then it's more likely to go out of the circulation. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking in the same vein, you know, as you, and if other people in this room have suggestions for acquiring more resources for this project, I mean, the Library of Congress would be a really interesting list, you know, the films that are uh, given for preservation, how those are picked, how those are kept, and that's literally is the kind of historical record of what's going to be kept uh, and what may fall apart, and obviously it would be a huge list, but you know, one that if you can find support or assistance might be really fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's it's really good idea. Here. It's almost arbitrary or idiosyncratic movies they get picked from. Yeah, 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 yeah. and they're nominated. Like people nominate yeah. films each year, I believe, and like then you know they select them. I don't know how, and then yeah, those are the ones that get preserved, and they are random. You're totally right. Yeah. You know, a few years ago, QRFE did a special issue on why aren't these films on DVD, mm -hmm. and just people just submitted any time, you know, a little paragraph about mm -hmm. a film that was not available that they'd seen somewhere or something that was just simply not on DVD. I don't know if that had any effect on anything. Mm -hmm. 
interesting. And now, of course, with streaming, you know, every time there's this, a, a new iteration of a new format, things disappear. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. One thing I will, first of all, this was really great. I really yeah. got a kick out of this. I mean, I, I really like these questions of taste and sort of canon formation and stuff. But And it's really important for those of us that teach film, too, to think about how we're perpetuating this. Because I see the list of, like, the sight and sound list every year, and I'm like, and, and I think about how, I wish, I mean, all my students need to see these films, you know? Like, I look and I say, well, everybody has to see these movies. But then if you start to focus just on those movies, then what are you excluding? And I know that you do that a lot in your own syllabi. You're really um, aware of that. And it's something I think I need to work on more. Um, also, one thing I thought was interesting too is the extent to which the, the, the making of these lists by individuals is performative. You know, like when you look at the sight and sound individual things, like it's really fun to go through those because people pick the weirdest crap because they, I think in many cases, the ones that float to the top just happen to be those ones where um, there, there's some kind of semi consensus that they show up. But overall, especially the sight and sound list, people are actively, I think, trying to go outside. The canon, but the problem is that when, when you go outside the canon and you pick your idiosyncratic choices, no one else picks those same choices, so those movies get erased, essentially. So if you look at the, um, some of those lists, I'm sure you've seen, they have a list of like every film that got a nomination, and at the bottom there's like hundreds of movies that got one vote. You know? And some of those are really, really interesting, but it's just a matter of kind of getting a consensus going, which is how you see like movies on, which is uh, IMDb, you know, of course, it's so problematic because it's movies that people have just seen recently that they happen to like. Right. Um, although, who, the women voting for American History X, I just am not going to understand <laughs> that entirely. Well, but if, it, if that's your list. Yeah. Obviously, you know, but, but I mean, that's the framework, and you have to choose. And they... But IMDb is a, any movie. You can vote for any right, movie right, you want. Right. So it just seems that, that they're voting for Fight Club and American History yeah. X and uh, Searchers. I wanted to bring, that's a good point, because I wanted to bring this up about queering the viewer, the gender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the, you make the point too that, you know, we're all caught up in kind of this hegemonic patriarchy of the past. But if you have like a gender fluid, like a woman, a cis woman, who's going to love searchers, let's say for example. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, I don't know what I want to say, it's not just women. Um, I think that the, that the categories of genre and the, and the uh, gender of the voters need to be queered more, yeah. or could be queered more. How so? What do you mean? Well, just be. <laughs> the, I mean, the, the men's genres, like the horror film. There's a lot of women, you know, as we know, who are you know into, into horror films too. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a male a male genre. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I would beware of the gender yeah, specificity know, always... of, of those genres. Like women's films, rom-coms, forget it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, now, I, mean, I think I do horror as, as neutral, actually. Uh, or not even neutral, um, but yeah. but fluid, gender fluid yeah. or something. Uh, yeah. The fluidity. And I think that partially is answered by uh, the his history you presented. Mm -hmm. You know, like these become embedded in our culture as viewers and as critics and as gendered people. You know what you're supposed to see and like. I'm reminded of um, well, Marianne Don't. You know, and the and the three positions that women have as spectators. You know, as a you know adopt. You know, putting on your transvestite clothes and adopting the male position that you're invited to do. You know, by the very nature of, of film aesthetics and and storytelling. Mm -hmm. So, um, or you could be. Which has three three categories. Another one is. Um, you know, the mas masochistic role. You know, your identity is with the person, woman being punished. Anyway, so there's more fluidity, I think, to uh, to the, the gender uh, play here. That makes sense. Yeah, that's true. I mean, how would you suggest dealing with that, though? Because I struggled with that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, that's, I was, I was, like, the genre thing, yeah. I know I was going out on a limb, because genres are so debatable. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I just wasn't sure else to, and there are some that are so clearly gendered and others that maybe less so, but like how do you account for that, you know? How do you account for that? Yeah. yeah. But that might like, go toward what I was saying about the IMDb too, that maybe women who have more t traditionally masculine tastes in movies are the ones who are more likely to be participatory in IMDb for the reasons that you mentioned. Right. So that they're more likely to vote, whereas other women are just like, I'm not going to get involved in I'm this stupid voting and, you know, or whatever. There's also, um, I've also kind of, in, this is something I've observed informally over the years, when you talk to women about what films they like, there's, a, there's often this gap, there's this like, I, I love this film, but I know it's, it's trash, or whatever, you know, or like, 
or like, oh, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I, like, I know this is a great film, but I just don't love it. Or, you know, there's this kind of gap. Whereas with, when you talk to men, there's like a lot less of that. So I think maybe there's something to that here too, you know, where women, like, like when, if you ask a woman what her favorite film is what versus what the best film is, there's very likely to be a gap with men. Perhaps there's some, I mean, there's some like, you know, men's, men's genre films that are, you know, that are like eye candy, whatever, but not as often, you know, I think. Yeah. You know, but maybe in that same vein, may, maybe that is performative too. You know, that you're not really, I mean, you want to kind of belong to some discursive fellowship, you know, and you yeah. don't want to say, you know, that I really like the action films, as a, you know, but I mean, so I, that those categories, it'd be interesting to redefine them because it's, I think it's too confining to call them women's genres and men's genres. I mean, it's a replication of yeah. kind of what you're trying to dismantle. Yeah, right? no, that's and true. And of, you know, that wonderful Western film that the woman, what was her name? She, Means uh, cut off? Cut off. Or Kelly. Yeah, Kelly. yes. Kelly. Yeah. That's not my favorite yeah. Film. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, that's a Western. That's yeah. a Western, yeah. You know? Yeah. And you're, you know, a f female filmmaker. Or a film noir. I mean, so it's. I would. I think I would probably be. Try to come up with another way of looking at mm -hmm. those. I mean, you can call them genres, but ascribing them to the a gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, I agree with you. It's too confining. Mm -hmm. right. But but I think it is true that certain. I mean, looking at genres in terms of critical status is important because that's going to part of what you're saying is that. A woman would be like, well, I really like this rom-com, but I know that it's just crap and it's not like a legit movie. Where because romantic comedies are kind of culturally disparaged, whereas a dude would be like, you know, the the Dark Knight is the best movie of all time. It's about a guy dressing up like a bat punching people, but there's no, <laughs> but, but there's, you know what I mean? But there's because action movies and, and superhero films are more have that legitimacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's that's deeply gendered too, and that's that's what the, the genre stuff is still important to keep, I think, to some extent. Right, it's a genre, but not. The gender, not the gender, yeah, okay. you know, or just at least like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I kind of, I try to give those scare quotes yeah. when I introduce the genre thing, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you that I know that it's problematic, but I also like, you know, films for women. That's one way to think about it, and, and that's a culturally disparaged category on the whole, you know. So yeah. you could go at it that way, you know, mm -hmm. what the kind of the dimension of the of the promotion of the pitch, yeah. the pitch of yeah. it is, yeah. 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 Where the demographic of well, the but how do you prove, like how do you decide that? Like if I'm looking at a given title, like I, you know, is it is it just I know it when I see it? It's a women's film, or like how do you, you know, is there some more it's, legitimate? Like, it's a poster or something, you know? And, <laughs> sure. You know, in a way. You could, yeah. I mean, people don't even use those terms anymore. Sorry. Maybe we just don't even use those terms anymore. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. So, when we're on a different tip but related, uh, since it's an high school event, I'm just, I know we're both like cautiously quantitative. We come from a humanities background and it's kind of like, all right, let me wade into it. But I'm just curious if there'd be some other data method that might be revealing. I mean, in my very reduced understanding of quantitative, I was thinking there might be like much higher standard deviations for some female oriented titles or like musicals or things like that. Whereas, like, say something like The Godfather may be very tightly grouped as this is a great movie and so that might be something that's revealing and that things get knocked down right because you know a one vote versus a ten vote on female titles would produce a really high standard variation versus a movie that just everyone accepts as this is great and I'm just curious if other kind of qu more quantitative oriented people in here have some ideas yeah, yeah great idea. um, I love that idea that like maybe some of them have wider dispersion mm -hmm. around the votes um, I was also wondering if the AFI um, did they ever publish like what's 101 and 102 and 103? No. <laughs> because, or, but they did publish the whole list of 400? No. No. Oh, that makes it harder. Um, because if there were a way to have the wider list, then um, you could compare, you could use regression discontinuity to look at the things that are um, sort of in the 90 to 100 range versus the 101 to 110 range. Oh, interesting. And try to see the boost. Actually, I think they from... did list the 400 films for that. They did a re, a re, they did like a redo in 2007, and they did list the 400 films then. So maybe, but they're not all the same as the 1997. But maybe, yeah, maybe there's a way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. there might be a way to sort of quantitatively say like. For the ones that made the top hundred, here's uh, like you came up with a number of interesting metrics about like are they in print? Are they available for 
for purchase in all these venues versus the ones that didn't make that top 100 list? Um, did they go out of print? Or um, So you could see the AFI effect, even if you didn't, uh, like, as a first order thing, even setting aside um, the gender, because so few of the, like, since gender is so rare there, you could just say, look, it made it onto this canonized list, mm -hmm. and then that has direct effects on what's available afterwards. Interesting. Um, that's a really good idea. <laughs> cool. I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. Oh, I'd love to. Wanna, cool. Cool. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, because also, you know, you also bring your mind, like, it's Citizen Kane's at the top of the list. Do they also include films that were influenced by Citizen Kane? So that that general aesthetic then becomes kind of a dominant mm. aesthetic through the 100 mm. films. Mm. You know, do they go then with, you know, Greg Tolan's cinematography or other deep space, you know, deep focus kinds of uh, mm. films? I just wonder about that, too, if that one influence that carries through it. Dominates. Well, yeah, that's not. Right. I mean, because can, I mean, there's a difference between. There's so often a difference between the films that are celebrated at the time and the films that are remembered. I mean, Citizen Kane, right. I mean, was not no. not particularly celebrated, and no. you know, many of the films that like win Best Picture at the Oscars and things. We, you know, you look back now and you're like, what is that? I've never heard of it. So, um, and I'm talking as a film historian, like, you know, <laughs> like, so you know, this, those are not necessarily the films that get remembered. Right. So there's a, so that's that's I think in itself a kind of process that's in, that would be interesting to to mm -hmm. investigate actually. I think I mean even among these auteur directors, I don't know, it just drives me nuts. I think like Banshee is such a better movie than Tokyo Story, but like you know that's a very yeah. female-driven film versus one that's like family and yeah. has some major male yeah. roles. Or I mean, like Kurosawa, he made a lot of male-oriented films. Yeah. Like nothing gets more male-oriented than Seven, Seven Samurai. Samurai, and so that that becomes the one title yeah. that's his versus some other ones that are more balanced. Mm -hmm. and, well, it's got that you know bravura editing yeah. camera work going on. So I think that is a no, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, but, down there with the mud and the horses. Mm -hmm. But then there are also some women's films that get elevated by virtue of being connected with a male auteur, like yeah. Cirque, for example, yeah. or Impulse. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah, so that's a weird dynamic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little after 11. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, I'm not sure what the plan is for the 